There's a very strange sound coming from the waiting room. Josh has named the noisy cocky Kettle for obvious reasons. You've got to be thinking break, but my fear is there may be more than one break and there could also be a dislocation in either that knee joint or the ankle joint. Either way, it's a serious injury. At the Bondi Clinic, bird expert Josh Cook has shattered the peace with a screaming baby. The little sulphur-crested cockatoo was found on a nearby golf course after plummeting 20 metres from his nest. He wouldn't have lasted, you know, overnight without a fox or a dog or a cat eating him. So, yeah, he was lucky to be found. There's a very strange sound coming from the waiting room. Josh has named the noisy cocky Kettle for obvious reasons. Josh. G'day, Chris. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. So I've got this little cocky who's pretty glad to see you too. He doesn't look too glad to see me. Look at him. No. But you can see pretty clearly compared to the other good leg, that one's hanging pretty limp. Mm. You've got to be thinking break. But my fear is there may be more than one break and there could also be a dislocation in either that knee joint or the ankle joint. Either way, it's a serious injury. You look at Kettle and he's the absolute picture of vulnerability. He's small, he's skinny, he doesn't have any feathers to his name and he's lost and alone. And he might have a fractured leg. He's in a bad way. He's not known for his silence, Kettle, so it will take a fair bit to um, subdue this beast. Oh, he looks so defeated. That's the fracture we're obviously looking for through there. The fortunate thing for Kettle is that he's probably got one of the best bird people in the country on his side, and you know, if anyone's going to nurse him through this, it's Josh. All right. How'd he go? Yeah, so he certainly does have a fracture there. Yep. Um, it's, sort of, it's a longitudinal fracture, so it's not straight across. Oh, OK. It's sort of at an angle. Right. Across the bone like that. Yep. But it is only one fracture. It's, it's been a real blessing. The trick's going to be whether we can actually get this to heal. Yeah. The big concern I had from the start was how much nerve damage Kettle had suffered in that foot from that injury. He's still not really clenching his toes. He doesn't really have that perching reflex. That's got to start appearing soon. Otherwise, Kettle really doesn't stand a lot of chance of, of being released back to the wild. It's be very delicate. Okay. Incredibly hard to do these splints. For these sort of procedures, we use some very high-tech equipment. Okay. Okay. So they mightn't look like much, but between a set of chopsticks, a paddle pop stick, and a plunger, I can pretty much fix any bird's leg. Just try me. So I think that syringe plunger might actually be the uh, might be the winner. Thank you, Dave. So it'll just cushion him if he tries to walk on it. If anyone ever thought they had a bad day, they should look at you, tonight, Kettle. Look at you. You're having a terrible day. Kettle saviour, bird carer Josh Cook may just have the answer to silence the pint-sized screamer. <laughs> Don't you like that, do you? Still whistling. One more, but look at this. Look at this. You fool. Did it stop the whistling? No. Not even close. Just need to rest a little, buddy. I'm going to be seeing a lot of Josh over the next few days and then over the next few weeks because these sort of things, they require constant monitoring. There you go. OK. No problem. See you, Chris. Thanks, mate. I'll see you soon. If that splint's too tight, it'll cut off the circulation to his toes and that'll really inhibit healing. 
but if it's too loose, then that bone's going to keep on moving and the bone won't start to mend. Get that? It's still here. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, likewise. Come on through. Thank you. It's a big welcome for Chris at Josh's Bird Menagerie. Here he is. Kettle, the screaming cockatoo, is ready for his final checkup. Look at you. That's fully dressed now. That little boy's grown up. This is how Kettle looked when Josh first brought him into the clinic after the baby broke his leg. What a difference two months has made. You take the cast off. Look at that. Nice and straight. Moment of truth. Oh. Nice work. Oh, shake it off. <laughs> In a few more months, a lucky cocky should be ready for release. Where's the whistle go? Hey, you'd be proud of yourself, aren't you? At the Bondi Referral Hospital Sash, yeah. two-year-old Stanley is fighting yeah. his own battle. The British Bulldog is struggling to breathe. I just feel like he's in pain the whole time. Worried owner Michael is trying his best to keep the Bulldog calm. Whenever he is around other dogs or gets really hot, he can't breathe properly, his throat swells up. Oh, I can't walk more than 500 metres. And that just starts. And it's just, you feel bad for him, you've got to take him home. Michael, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Andrew Marcheski, how are you? Stanley! <laughs> Sound like a diesel. That's the loudest snore that I think I've heard out of a bulldog. He's, that's pretty bad. So he's two years old. How long has he sounded like this? Over a year, yeah. If you don't do something before the next summer, he'll be in a whole heap of trouble. No, he's soft palate. It's like the flap at the back. Yeah, the little dangly, dangly bit. Yeah. But theirs is, in dogs, it's much more broad. And in these guys, it's really broad, really thick and really long. If we don't do something now, his whole voice box will just end up collapsing. Yeah. And if it gets to that point, the only thing we can do is put a permanent tracheostomy in him. A tracheostomy. There's a hole in here. And that's, you can do it, but it's really high maintenance and they don't get a normal quality of life out of it. Michael knows that if something isn't done soon, he risks losing his buddy. He's just going to overheat and um, pass away. You know, that's, that's generally what could happen. Oh, mate! It gets worse and worse. It gets worse and worse. Oh, yeah, he will look for it. Every breath he takes, he's having to breathe that little bit harder. It creates a lot of negative pressure. And with too much negative pressure, their whole voice box can start collapsing. And there's no point in me trying to look down his throat because he'll just get distressed. So the only way we can do it is to, to anaesthetise him. Have a look, make the assessment, and say, OK, we've got to do this, 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 and then just do it. I think that's the best option. I don't think he'll see this. I don't think he'll see the summer through. And that was what we were worried about. Yeah, have a lick, and that'll quiet. Yeah, you go. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come, yeah. Drive, drive, drive. It's exciting, mate. Hey? It'll be quieter when you sniff. <laughs> yeah. Andrew wants to operate on Stanley immediately. We'll just throw him in here. But first, the bulldog needs to calm down. For Michael, it's a reluctant goodbye. So can we come in tomorrow afternoon or just wait? I would not visit him. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably not visit him, period. Just wait to the end. Yeah. Uh, if he gets excited yeah, right. and it's really vascular and it just sets off a bit of bleeding because he's jumping around, you don't yeah. want to do that. See you, mate. Any operation, human or animal, it's, you know, it's an operation. Things can go wrong. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh. 
Stanley is ready for his life-saving respiratory surgery. He's been sedated and he's obviously much calmer and quieter. We're going to open up his airways. We'll open up his nostrils because they're really narrow. His soft palate, tighten it up. 99 standard. <laughs> oh, God. That soft palate's just sitting almost halfway down his windpipe. All Bulldogs, their soft palates are a bit long, but he's a gold medal winner. If Stanley's overgrown soft palate isn't shortened, Andrew fears the Bulldog wouldn't survive another summer. When he's breathing really hard, this is just going up and down like that and just obstructing his whole larynx. In extreme cases, if they're breathing so hard and it's you know, a really hot day, their lungs can fill up with, with fluid and that you know, is really catastrophic. just a huge amount of tissue that I've had to take out there. It's really thick and fleshy. And that's the other problem. When it's so thick like that, it just fills up the whole airway. A huge chunk of Stanley's overgrown palate has been removed to help him breathe normally. Next, Andrew needs to widen Stanley's nostrils. What I'm going to do is just take a wedge of tissue out and suture it closed. It'll be much easier for, again, air to get in. This is probably the bloodiest part of the surgery. We'll do the same on the other side, and every little bit will just make it that much easier for him to breathe. So now we just make sure they wake up quietly and slowly. Although Andrew's happy with the way the surgery has gone, any excitement to Stanley can cause swelling or rupturing of his delicate blood vessels. If we don't watch him, he could again suffocate, obstruct and die. So he'll basically be getting 24-hour care for the next 36 hours. Good dog. Come on, Stanley. Hey, you gonna come out and see what you're doing? I can't hear you. It's hard to believe that when Stanley first arrived at Sash, the staff could barely hear themselves think above the bulldog's laboured breathing. Stanley, good boy, Kimmy. It's been an amazing transformation. It's a bit better, isn't it, mate? Oh, what a good dog. Really, really good. I definitely couldn't have hoped for anything better than this, you know, just a few days down the track. Sit. Oh, what a good sit. What a good boy. Can I have a look at your nose? Well, that's healing together well. You're not snoring too much. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's all right. Hey? Oh, he's a good boy. You're Yes, OK. The proof of the pudding is going to be when he goes out and meets Michael and Brittany, because he'll get really excited. Um, and, you know, if he doesn't sound like a steam train after that, then I'll have done my job. I'm excited to see him, um, but a bit nervous. I just want him to be better, really. Stan! Stan! Who's that? Hello! Hello, buddy! Pretty exciting. Don't excite him too much. No, Stanley was so excited to see Brittany and Mike, but he was quiet as a mouse. You just couldn't hear him. That means I've done what I set out to do. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Thank All you so much right. for everything. Thanks yeah. a lot, Lovely to meet you. That's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Good boy. This summer will be a breeze for him. I think he's going to have a pretty normal bulldog life. Calm down. Recall. I think he's getting stressed a bit now. At the Richmond practice, Leon and Agnes are hoping Scott can help six-year-old Rico. Their miniature schnauzer can't be left alone without constantly barking and crying. 
he gets very hyper he starts panting and it's just gets into that state that uh, you know it's very dangerous for him as well he's got a condition of epilepsy and we just don't want to have that happen that he falls down and, and has the the fits when we are not there if it's okay with you i think that we need to see this behavior in action so um can i invite myself to your house yeah of sure. course yeah hey scotty says relax <laughs> Hey, Leon. Hey, Jay. Hi, Hi, Agnes. Hello. Wow, I can hear the boy yes. is already kicking off. <laughs> come in, come in. Thank you very much. much. Coming in. Oh, my goodness. He's very, very vocal, and I'm amazed that the neighbours aren't complaining. Scott's arrival at Agnes and Leon's home has immediately brought Rico's anxiety issues to the surface. Hello, champ. How are you going? But Hello. his frantic barking is all show. Straight away he greets me very, very positively. He's a really friendly, sweet dog and he loves lots of cuddles. You one affectionate little fellow, aren't you? Hey, you like a cuddle and a smooch, don't you? Well, it's very good to see that he's a very sociable and affectionate dog. Yeah. What I really need though is to see how he behaves when you're not here. And then we can just understand the problem a little more. To be able to see Rico behave normally, I need to do a bit of surveillance. Leon, you and I will go next door and we'll watch yeah. the footage. Agnes, you're going to be doing exactly what you do when you leave the house. So you're just going to be putting your shoes on, grabbing your keys, grabbing your bag, and then leaving. And sure. then we're going to be watching uh, little Rico and see how he behaves. Sound good? Perfect. Excellent. All let's right, go. let's get stuck in. This is a fantastic house because I actually get a live feed as to how the dog is behaving. Um, Feels like we're in mission control. Yes. Should we grab a seat no, and settle in? We need some popcorn. Yeah. Interestingly, he's already looking at the door. Yeah. Just by her putting her shoes on. Correct. So he's relating the two already. Okay. Oi. Okay. Rico, sit. Stay. Good boy. Closing the door. It's quiet. For about four or five seconds. Yes, that's, a, that's it. <laughs> he really gets pretty stressed pretty quick, doesn't he? I mean, he's gone from just a little bit of whimpering yeah. to barking to howling. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's really going for it. How long have you seen him actually bark for? Um, we've, we've about an hour. All he can think of when Agnes leaves the house is I'm just going to scream until she comes back. After observing Rico's reaction, Scott phones Agnes and asks her to come back. Come down. Calm down, Rico. And one mistake Calm she down. makes straight away is immediately giving Rico lots of attention. And that's understandable, that's human nature. If an animal's upset, you're going to want to try and make it feel better. But actually what she's doing is unwittingly reinforcing the barking. I bark, mummy comes back and gives me a cuddle. Well guys, I think it's pretty clear from today that he has a condition called separation anxiety. Uh, and the reason that he's developed that is purely and simply stress. I mean, he's lost his primary care in your dad yeah. and he's driven over a thousand miles to come to the UK. And even though you guys are such dedicated caring owners, it's still a new environment. With the added complication of Rico's epilepsy, a solution needs to be found quickly. That we need to. There's two big words I'm going to throw at you, okay? So the first one is called counter conditioning, and that's basically getting him to start thinking positively about something he thought about before as negative. So you living the house, that sucks. He hates it. Yeah. He does not want you to do that. So what we need to try and do is encourage him to think positively. So what you're going to be doing from now on is you're going to give him something to chew or something to play with just before you're about to leave. And so then he can start thinking positively because normally, particularly as boys, we yeah. love it when we get food and it's gonna make us feel positive and feel yeah. happy. These are treat balls. Basically, you can pop his normal food in there yeah. and it rolls around. And then he's encouraged to look for his food. It's investigative. It makes him think about how he can get it out. So it's problem solving, using his brain, but also the food that you give him can be entertainment. And this is the way to make that happen. Then after him getting used to various treats and toys, then the next thing is something called desensitization. 
You, what you need to try and do is to actually ignore him for about 15 minutes before you leave and about 15 minutes after you arrive so that you leaving the house and returning isn't exciting. It's actually really boring. Yeah. And boredom for dogs is actually an effective means of getting them to get over a behaviour. Agnes and Leon have to earn a living. So if Rico continues to behave this way and they start getting neighbours complaining, who knows, the worst case scenario would be they'd have to rehome him. And I really, really hope that, that won't be the end of the story for them. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Very good. My goodness, it's very quiet in here. It's been two weeks since Scott's first visit to see the stressed out Rico. And a lot has changed. No barking. Goodness me, the change in you, hey? Are you being a good boy, hey? So far, so good. But Scott needs to see what happens when the schnauzer is left alone. Rico is very calm and very relaxed in the house with us there, and that's fantastic. But I'm really intrigued to see the footage that Agnes and Leon have captured of Rico when they do leave the house. So this is the bit um, we filmed this morning. So this is Agnes coming in. So I'm just coming in basically getting him occupied with some food as well, like you mentioned with the little toys, so he can get occupied with his mind trying to get the food out. Good boy. The food ball works exceptionally well to distract Rico from when his owners are going to leave the apartment, but also it ties him out. It makes him work for his food and also work out the way in which he can get the food out of the ball, which is tiring out his mind as well as his body. So it's a perfect, perfect tool for Rico. So this is pretty much when we're kind of preparing ourselves to go to work. You know, the dog will still be in the room with us and then we'll just give him a command just to sit and stay. And basically just not interacting with him much so he can just get himself settled. It's difficult to stay away from him. He's a lovely, cute dog and he wants your love. So you kind of automatically want to give him the love. Good idea, nice and calm, getting prepared for that leave. So that's yeah. good, that's perfect. Nice and calm and, yeah. and close it. This is interesting. And this is where I think the most improvement we've made where, yeah. you know, he's in his bed, he's staying. This is great. I mean, this is a calm, relaxed dog. You've left, he's like, eh, I know yeah. they'll be back. <laughs> Rico, that is so good. They've proved that old dogs can learn new tricks and they've taught this dog that it's okay to be by yourself sometimes. Good boy. Here you go, good boy. It's really good to see the training and discipline, it actually works. Good boy. At Perth Zoo, Peter's on the move to see his next patient. My favourite thing about working here is that I get to ride a bike from patient to patient. I just love this place and getting on my bike and riding around visiting uh, the animals is just incredible. This time, Peter is going to need to use special protection equipment. It's an extremely loud patient, um, so I'm going to need these. You ready to go? What? <laughs> Despite using protective earphones, Peter and vet nurse Lisa can still hear the piercing call of an endangered juvenile red-tailed black cockatoo nicknamed Rowdy. The noisy patient was hit by a car nearly two months ago and suffered a nasty break in her wing. So this is a bit of a tricky bit. We've got to get the mask over her face to give her the anaesthetic gas without getting bitten. Peter is hoping to be able to remove a device that's been holding the bird's wing in place while it heals. Anaesthetising Rowdy will be the only way to carry out the procedure safely. This beak is incredibly big and incredibly strong and I could easily lose my finger if she accidentally gets a hold of me. All right, I've got the gas on. You can see her little eyes getting sleepy now. You happy she's asleep? Yeah. Yeah. Birds metabolise the anaesthetic drugs very quickly. So now we've got the mask off. I've got to get my tube in quickly or she'll wake up. That's in. If she were to wake up, there's a real risk that she would clamp down on my finger while I'm putting that tube in, or she will clamp down on the tube and actually bite the end off and we could lose it into her airway. 
Alright, let's see. I'm just gonna open her beak. Ah, she bit me. Ah, just checking. <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Such beautiful birds. One of our most amazing West Australian species right here. And you can see this, this beautiful girl. She had some feathers missing from her injuries when she got hit by the car, but she's starting to regrow them now, which is good. This is her external fixator. This has been in place for about seven weeks now. It's basically a bit of metal that's going through her bone and coming outside of her body, holding that bone together. It's this device that Peter is hoping to remove today but only if the wing has healed enough. Let's position her for x-rays. Have you set that to 75 centimetres? Yeah. If the wing hasn't healed properly, it could spell the end of Rowdy's chance to return to the wild. So I'm just assessing this bird's range of, of motion in her wing. This is her fractured wing over here, and you can see this wing is a lot tighter. All the ligaments and tendons have, um, have contracted down in response to this fracture and the healing. She's going to need time for this to heal and to re-stretch and reuse these muscles normally, and that's where the rehab process comes in, where she's going to learn how to use this wing again. Just feel it, make sure our bones are in the right place. Yep, OK. The x-rays show that Rowdy's wing is healing well, so Peter can start by removing yeah, the stitches. Just these couple here. Yeah. Next, he needs to unscrew the external fixator that's been bracing the wing. Essentially, what she has in her wing is a series of pins and connectors, and the fracture is about here, and um, they're stabilising the bone either side. Once I remove this support beam, her fracture is no longer going to be stabilised, and um, I've got, just got to be careful that it is healed properly because if it's not, we could refracture her wing. Now we just want to have a, a good feel of it. It feels really good. Uh, the, the fracture feels like it's healed properly and there's no movement in it. It's great. Peter's confident he can now remove the remaining pins. So I've just got my chuck here to help me unscrew them. The pins have to be gently removed, with Peter aware that the delicate wing could easily refracture. There we go. All right, so this last one here that's bending up is going all the way through the bone at the moment, so right through the middle of that bone, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to, to wiggle all the way out, so I've just got to be careful with this one. There it is. So you can see it was all the way inside that broken bone. One side of the broken fracture here, another side of the fracture here, and this would have been holding those two sides together. It's time for the cockatoo to wake up. I'm going to turn him off. So birds do tend to wake up a lot quicker than other animals. So Lisa ready. must maintain a firm grip in case Rowdy strikes out with her powerful beak when she returns to consciousness. Come on, sweetie. I'm going to wake up and feel you in your wing. Oh, there's an eye. Can I have a chew? There we go. The last step for Peter and Lisa is to get Rowdy back in her pack without incident. Don't let go now. <laughs> Watch out, yep. She's <laughs> oh, <wow>. awake. <laughs> She's back in her pet pack and ready to go back to the rehab centre. Removing the brace is a milestone, but this young cockatoo still has months of recovery ahead. It could be a year before her wing is fully healed and she could be released back into the wild. Hey, we're beautiful. In Melbourne, 18-month-old Simon and his little brother Evan are enjoying some playtime with Simon's mum, Rosie. Simon is a huge presence in my life. He follows me everywhere and he's my biggest constant. I adore him and am very obsessed with him and it feels like it's mutual. <laughs> what are you doing? The problem is the Chocolate Point Siamese is such a constant in Rosie's life, he never leaves her alone. 
I was weak when I first got him and I let him just always spend heaps of time with me and just sleep with me and all that. And now as I'm trying to create a little bit more distance in our lives, he will scream. Hello baby. Sort of starts softer. The more you ignore it, the louder and more incessant it becomes. He just keeps going, it doesn't stop. It's not a pleasant experience, it's not survivable. Siamese cats can live for like 20 years and I can't have Simon screaming for 20 years. I'm not willing to give him up, he's going to stay with me. So we need to sort this out. Fortunately, Dr. Danny is making a house call and Rosie hopes she can do something to curb Simon's incessant screaming. She's here. Hello. Hello, Rosie. Hello. Come in, come in. It's so good to see you. You too. Come Hello, Simon. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hi, come say hello to Danny. How are you? How's it been? Simon is just screaming and howling and Today I've come to see my friend Rosie. I can see how Rosie and him just have this beautiful relationship and I don't blame Rosie for just being absolutely in love with him. Hi, how are you going? This is Georgia, Hi, this is Georgia. Danny. Nice to see you. Hi Evan, oh hello little Baba, you gorgeous. Simon's boisterous behaviour is also a problem for Evan's owner, Rosie's housemate Georgia. Good boy. It's like a child screaming. Very loud, very visceral, very stressful. Oh, mate. You do seem quite stressed out, hey? Oh, he is a bit of a stress head. Yeah. I just think it can't be good for him. He's just screaming and, like, howling for hours. So when are you noticing the, the screaming, the, these moments? It's whenever I leave his space. If I go to the bathroom, if I have a shower, if if I'm asleep and he's outside of the bedroom. It's disrupting our sleep, it's pushing us to the edge really. From everything you're describing, it sounds like we've got a few things going on, probably an element of generalised anxiety, but also separation anxiety. These yep. things are only going to exacerbate with time if we don't address them. Anxiety in cats is really common and underdiagnosed. I'm concerned that if we don't take active steps to help with the underlying anxiety and stress that is causing these behaviours, that, he, that he's not going to grow out of it, but in fact just become more stressed. Oh, look at him. Oh, oh this is where he's not meant okay. to be. Yeah, so this is retreat when yeah. he's stressed, when he's, yeah. We've just got to find a space that's going to be as appealing to him that's yeah. not in here. Okay. The first thing we need to do is find a replacement safe haven for Simon. At the moment, that is Rosie's bedroom, but we do need to make a change to that. Essentially what you want is somewhere that he can hide. Yes. Um, even to start with, for something like a cardboard box would be fine. Okay. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Perfect. That would be great. Let's tape these ends so it's really deep. Wow. I have spotted a little corner in the dining room. That's probably going to be our best option. I'm thinking if we can move the wine rack, that this corner could be a really great spot to create their little new safe haven. Do you think that's a good idea, Simon? That's a good idea, okay. This is a lot of fun, creating this little cardboard box cubby house. Alright, so we'll put that in there. I actually would like to go in there myself. Oh, is that for you? Mm. Please sleep in there, Simon. <laughs> Please sleep in there. I definitely wasn't expecting a small cubby house under the stairs as a solution. But after seeing how he approached the safe haven that we created for him, seeing him go inside and have a look, I think there is a real chance that he's going to embrace it. and. Hopefully, it will mean that we all get a better night's sleep. Part two of Danny's plan is to fill the room with a scent that will make Simon feel safe in his new cubby house. 
So these appeasing pheromone diffusers and sprays are derived from the pheromone that the mother cat emits to her kittens. So it's that feeling of security and comfort and it's very effective for any cat that's feeling a bit stressed. Keep the cats happy. Yes, hopefully. I think that would be good. There's one more element of my plan and that's going to be to do with their daily routines. Okay, so I've got one last idea for you guys Ooh. and that is all stemming around enrichment and play. I've created a beautiful toy for Simon today, a lovely cardboard box, but it is great. It's, it's simple, it can make it anywhere, just a, holes in a cardboard box and something interesting in there, treats, toys, whatever it is, but it's great for that self-play. What we need to do is come up with like a schedule routine through your day where you have interactive play. So he knows when to predict he's got to have fun time with mum and then he should hopefully cope better when he can't be with you. He was a bit unsure and then Danny kept coaxing and coaxing and in the end he was loving that little, little cardboard box toy. Fingers crossed, he's worn out and <laughs> sleeps the night through. That would be amazing. Thank you so much for coming over, Danny. It's a pleasure. Keep me in the loop. Yeah, I will. Okay, good luck, you guys. See you. Bye, Danny. It would mean so much if I can make a difference to Rosie and Simon and, and the issues that they're having at the moment and create a lovely, harmonious household. That would just mean the world. Two weeks later, and there's been some progress with Simon's bedtime behaviour. Since Danny's visit, everything's been going really well. I think the pheromones must really work because Simon's a lot more chilled. It's been amazing. We've been like cooking dinner or watching TV, having a glass of wine. We'll be like, where are the cats? They've been gone for ages. And we'll come round and we'll have a look and they'll both be curled up in their little cubby safe haven together. Simon's happy, I'm happy, George is happy. I mean, Evan's always been happy. We're a happy household. Thank you, Dr. Daddy. I'm Dr. Kate Adams and welcome to Bondi Pet, a new destination for pet health and well-being. Our site is filled with everything to fulfill your pet's needs so that you can make healthy choices for your pets.